Wow. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this exciting Talks at Google event. We're so happy to have you all here. Wasn't that performance incredible? <laughs> I'm Bradley Horowitz, a VP of Product Management here at Google, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this very special event with Cirque du Soleil, and it's about their newest show, Volta, which just opened in San Jose, and especially about the behind-the-scenes work that goes into creating a show like Volta and each and every one of their shows. Yeah. So let's welcome Ron and Bernard. Okay. All right, please. Right here, great. Perfect. Yep. Would you like us here? Uh, either way. Okay, great. Yeah. Bernard, focus. Oh, okay. Uh oh. Oh my God. <laughs> 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 All right. First step of casting. I'm not throwing away my shot. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> am I in? Impressive. Yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> you, 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 you pass the basics. <laughs> okay. The basics, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, it's our pleasure to welcome you here today. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and I think we'll just start with some introductions. I gave a very brief introduction of your titles and, and roles, but, but we don't know what that means. So maybe, Ron, you could start. Tell us first a little bit about your background and then a little bit about what you do for Cirque du Soleil. Uh, great, thanks. Well, first of all, it's uh, thrilling to be here on a, a personal level. My first job out of college in 1987, I actually was across the street on Rangsdorp, so it's, I'm thrilled to be back. It's a sports entertainment company. We own that building now. I, I realize that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was a college gymnast, and they killed our uh, gymnastics program, so I became a college cheerleader. And so the company that I worked for was called United Spirit Association. They were based here, and they're now one of the largest sports entertainment and corporate companies, entertainment companies in the United States. And then I went off to do uh, Broadway. I performed on Broadway in several shows for many years and toured around the country and the world for 15 years. Stopped performing, became a choreographer and a director, worked with uh, a lots of big sports entertainment events like uh, I've been doing the NFL Pro Bowl halftime shows for the last 19 years and uh, choreographed Iron Man 2 with Robert Downey Jr. and directed a lot of theater around the country and then Cirque came calling and it's been a pleasure to work as an artistic director for the company. And just a little bit, we'll get into this more, of course, but what does an artistic director do? That's a great question. It can be a bit confusing. What I do, um, there is the creatives, the conceptors of a show. So they build and basically deliver the show. Then there's the management of the show. So that's where the artistic director comes in. Mm -hmm. I take on the show as it is. And what we, our job is, is to basically maintain a show that we can do eight to 10 shows a week uh, with all the different changes and challenges that we have to deal with in moving the show, while at the same time evolving the show. Mm. We want to make sure that if the audience has seen that show a year ago, that if they see it again, which we hope that they will, that they actually will see it the same concept, but new elements. Mm. So that's how we keep our shows fresh. No, oh, I can't wait to dig into that. But first, Bernard, tell us a little bit about your background and uh, what does a casting director do? Uh, my background, I, uh, I was a gymnast. Yes. Uh, um, um, I, I had an education in physical education and then a master degree in performance analysis and a doctorate in cognitive sciences, which was not completed because I got an offer by Cirque du Soleil at one point of my career. I've been coaching for 22 years and teaching Montreal University 18 years, and now it's 20 years at Cirque du Soleil. Uh, and I was hired to basically implement a whole system in Montreal at the headquarters so that we could um, sustain or help the, the, the show to be sustained in, in their performance and also help the creation of the new shows. Mm. No shame in dropping out, Larry, Sergey. It's, it's what we do here in Silicon Valley. Uh, so um, let's get into some of the behind the scenes magic that you guys are responsible for. So Ron, every Cirque show is imaginative uh, from the storyline to the costumes, to the themes, to the acrobatics and performances. So how is the theme for a show decided? Like what is the process? Where do you start? And how does it evolve into this amazing production that we, we can go see in San Jose? You know, I think uh, the best way of uh, answering that is that it starts with where are we in reality and time. Right now we're dealing with pop culture. We're dealing with um, instant gratification. So what Cirque has, I think, done so well is take what's happening right now or in the past mm -hmm. and bring it forward. 
So the idea right now with Volta specifically is really about acceptance and that every single person's individuality is very important. We've sort of found ourselves in this world of capturing and creating the narrative and sort of, sort of hiding behind what we want people to see. What's very special about Volta is the conceptors went, let's get back to who we really are and how uniquely special every individual is. Mm -hmm. And that's what our show is about. Yeah, and that's, that's the reality also of Cirque du Soleil is that diversity. And it starts, you know, supporting, let's see, the idea, the initial idea. Then it starts also with casting who mm. you would select actually for the, the various uh, acts that you have to build around this, this big idea and this concept. What is amazing to me is that the show is at once extremely topical and on point to what's happening in the world, but it's also timeless and spans mm -hmm. cultures and spans you know, generations. So it has this universal appeal and it does all of this sort of without being on the nose and over the top about it. So it's an amazing art to sort of convey all that without, um, without uh, lyrics or necessarily uh, you know, verse. It's all done and conveyed through uh, choreography. Yeah, and it's interesting because when you look at it, that reality of creative reality, Cirque du is really good at inviting creators, people that have you know, an experience, a background, and inviting them around the table, around a team, and then managing that environment and supporting them so that they go through the journey of you know, the discussion and the development of the ideas. And when you add on top of that, it's, you know, the team would be around 20 to 25 people. Uh, and mm -hmm. part of that, maybe four or five are only from intern creators and everybody else is from outside and invited for that specific project. And then you add after that the artists that are coming from various backgrounds, various culture also. Okay, you saw the, this act are coming from Japan. Okay, in Volta you will see also the BMX people are coming from this urban activity. Okay, that is also free in spirit and supporting the idea of the show. And they are contributors to the, the journey of creating. Yeah, I imagine they have to be because you can't basically say, let's get someone who can skip at you know, six skips per second and then find out if that's feasible. You uh -huh. sort of have to you know, yeah. be in dialogue with what's possible. Yeah. And I want to talk to you about that process. Um, how do you survey all that's out there? You know? So it's, it's a big world, and there's you know, from Japan to San Jose, there's a lot of interesting things going on. How do you keep a pulse on what's cutting edge and what's possible? It's, it's, it, it's two ways. There's the traditional way that you will find the casting process, which is basically, in our case, is going to the various circus festival, uh, doing the audition. Okay, as we normally do uh, in, in casting, but and like also you say circus festivals. There's like a conference circuit for people in the circus. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, those big festival, uh, you know, where you can find actually uh, uh, circus professionals. You're and going to other circuses and poaching. Is that what you're so, so, telling, <laughs> telling me? <laughs> and then we're also going to competitions, and okay. then I have a specific, a specific agreement with the International Gymnastic Federation, so where I can go to all of these worlds and you know Olympics and so on, and then keep that relationship. Because what you have to understand is nobody has an obligation to produce the talent for Cirque. Right. So we have to find a way. Okay, There's so no that, farm team, really. That's, that's sort it. Of, so we have to find. Like you're saying, maybe some of the things you do is look at adjacent things like BMX, right? Uh -huh. and, and, so, and, and so, so there's that, that way. But also there is the technology. There is YouTube. So we scan through the YouTube. We also have our web. We have also created a community. And then we're, we're extending now and looking at, the, you know, um, new strategies and sort of open source whereby people could actually uh, inform us of some specific talent that we, we have not discovered yet or a person that has a craft or something that would be interesting for us. Okay, so, so we're, we're very then, honored and glad you use YouTube. These folks built it, or some uh -huh, of them. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and it is amazing. Um, how do you feel about like little snippets of Cirque performances ending up on YouTube? Is that OK, so long as it's appropriately it's, tagged? It's, it's very interesting, because it's OK in, term, in, in terms of the indication of what's happening out there, you know, what's, what's on, on YouTube that could also serve as an inspiration. Uh, but we need to go further. Uh, we need to meet these people. We need to see if yeah. what they do is sustainable over time. Let's see, if you take a touring show, it's about 360 uh, occasion of performances. Mm -hmm. If you go to our permanent show, it's 470 times. Okay, so you, you, you need to select people that have the ability to sustain that level, like okay, in consistency. Reliable, repeatable. Yeah, that, yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
And it's, it's actually really exciting, the, the YouTube platform, because for someone like myself who is uh, creative always and having to evolve a show, that's where I do a lot of my research, where I go find these amazing artists that don't have the platform if they're living in a small rural village in a, a small country that doesn't have the access to this uh, performing world. We can find them because they can post instantaneously what they do. And it's amazing what we find. It also helps us to stay innovative. Excuse me. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. And, and yeah, and the other thing also, because I have, uh, I'm responsible of a, of a team that is doing equipment and performance development. And then we scan what's happening out there. And then we use that as an inspiration. Let's see if there's a new tool or something that we think, OK, so if we modify that, or if we go if we push it a little bit further, OK, or if we meet this, these people, and then if we establish a project, then we can actually uh, you know, push the performance. This is one of the questions I wanted to ask. How much do you focus on augmenting the performance with, you know, whether it's a bicycle or a wheel? I've seen all kinds of things. Like, could it be a robot or bionics? Like, like is there a limit to how far you would apply technology in service of the performance? Or do you like to keep it a little more grounded in the human aspect of, of our own bodies? Um, I'll start, OK, oh, Ron, if you want, OK? Uh, actually, yeah, looking at the, the technological part, it, it should be there to, to help to enhance Okay, to ensure that it's, it's sort of giving a new opportunity. It's not replacing the human, because fundamentally, Sig uh, Saleh is based on that human uh, presence. Um, and basically, we've done, we've ventured ourselves working with, with robots. And it's very interesting, because we created also an act with, uh, let's say, a KUKA uh, a robot. Uh, comic act mm -hmm. uh, with that. It, so there is a lot of pr possibilities as long as uh, it's integrated in the performance and it's it's kind of helping the performance to even look better or to surprise with something that you would not expect as a physical, let's see, uh, mm -hmm. a relationship. Mm. And I would only add that it helps with the theatricality of it. I think as long as it stays in that space of wow, we're evolving, we're raising the consciousness, while at the same time uh, inviting people into the story. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, a, a great partnership and synergy when we accomplish those things, and I think it helps us stay on the cutting edge of entertainment, which is really exciting. Let's talk a little bit about the tech, because a, a show like Volta doesn't happen without a tremendous amount of back office technology. We sort of see the end product, but the synchronization, the lights, the music, the performers, um, can you speak a little bit about what's sort of going on behind the scenes? Well, you know, I have an amazing team, our artistic team, our technical teams. Um, it is critical. It's, like, it's really like air traffic control. There's one person who's our GSM who's calling a show in real time, and literally the conversations are cue to cue. For example, we, we, we're using um, high level um, technology and music together. And what we're doing is, if an artist is going for a trick, for example, and they're on uh, the BMX, and we know that we want to coordinate lighting, video, at the same time music with the accent of this incredible trick that the artist is about to do. Many times the artist will miss the trick, not fall, but they don't execute it in a way that they want to. The artist will indicate that they're going to do it again. So we're actually performing in real time with live musicians, and we will get a cue from our general stage management that says, we're going back to measure for our band leader cues to the musicians that we're all going back lighting and videos so that we nail it at the right moment. So in it's, real time, you've got to be able to skip back four exactly. measures and, wow. And in terms of performance, it's interesting also because we are using a lot, a lot of motors in automation. And there is this relationship between the guy that is controlling you know, the motors and then the performers. Let's see Strap as an example, where people will fly up in the air and then come back on the stage very, very smoothly. That rapport and using this instrument of, of the motor and all of the technology is very important for the performance. Is there a single conductor? Is there someone with a baton who is sort of, uh, you know, running that timeline? Or you know, there, that would be considered the uh, general stage manager. But there is the musical director, the band leader, and they're in great communication. We also use a signal that's very uh, pedestrian now, but it still works. It's the red light, green light system mm -hmm. for all departments. So technically and uh, musically, automation, every department knows that, and even the artists when they're performing in real time. If we're not set up and all elements aren't safe, there's a red light in four different places on stage. And until they see the green light, no one goes further. 
So that's how we also communicate with the artists on stage. Amazing, and I, I assume safety is paramount. I mean, what you're safety. doing is no joke, and um, you know, you guys must put that at the forefront of, of all thought. Yeah, and, and safety for me, when I look at it you know, from a global perspective, it starts from, from the first casting steps. I mean, we're, we're selecting individuals that have a proven ability to perform. In other words, you know, they are not de developing themselves from the scratch when they arrive at Cirque. And it starts from there that, with that specific profile. And after that, we go through, especially in creation, we go through all of these steps, okay, in terms of making the appropriate progression, testing every uh, steps and every component of an act, and then ensuring that we do that in training, then after that we do that in, in, in show condition by the time it ends up on the stage. And then you have the same thing also with integration, right. where you're taking all of these steps to control you know, the security aspect and the safety aspect. Mm. So all Cirque shows are moving. I think some of them are very dreamlike and sort of um, touching deep parts of ourselves. There's a little bit of a dark side to them sometimes, right? Like it's not all, um, you know, Disney and fairy tale. There's sort of some, you know, it's a it's a show that can be very adult. Can you talk about that shadow aspect or sort of the the blend of the uplifting and positive message around tolerance and, uh, but also sort of the the darker side? Yeah, I think that it's really important to it's sort of that commentary on reality that our shows sort of push the envelope. Uh, we make people think, we make people walk away going, I'm not sure. And I think so often in entertainment, we want it to have a happy ending. I think sometimes it's really important as, as storytellers, as innovators, that we leave a space where you're going, what was that? Or what does that make me feel? Or how am I relating to that? Because then out of that, we're pushing everyone's consciousness. And I think that's what Cirque does brilliantly without being, we're just gonna be esoteric. It's more about, let's put on this dreamlike reality that we walk away going, I felt like I had a dream. And we go, right. Now, what was that dream for you, you know? Yeah, I really have had that experience. As you're leaving, we're, you debrief with everyone. Yeah. What did you take away? And it's fun to sort of see how personal the experience can be for everyone and how different people pick up on different aspects of that, which just really speaks to the richness of the show and how much thought goes into it. Um, tell us a little bit about the costuming, because that's something that um, is integral to the performance. And you know, the costumes we just saw are absolutely amazing. And, almost hard to parse, you know, there's so much going on there. Um, how, how are the costumes developed? And is that, again, from the inception or is that done later in the process? No, it's from the inception. And, and again, we go through that uh, creative team. So we'll, we'll uh, you know, find the costume designer and the costume designer will work with our costume shop. And within the costume shop, there is an R&D you know, uh, department. And they basically, they will go from maquette and ideas and then they will test various, uh, uh, various possibilities, and all of the craftsmen, or people that are used to create a, our costume, will contribute with the creator, finding the, the appropriate solutions. What we've developed now with the technology is, I mean, we'll, we, we use the 3D uh, print, you know, the scan and so on, which actually accelerate the process or allow to test the idea and see if it's gonna work. Uh, so all of that process is combined with uh, the whole team in terms of, of the training that is being done and also all of the costume that is being developed and every step uh, leads to decisions and acceptance of, of what is being designed mm -hmm. so that it fits with the concept. And that's all done in Montreal. And then after that, when it's on the road, uh, then Ron is <laughs> continuing the journey uh, with everybody that is being replaced and actually, or even the costume that you can talk about. That's right, so once we get the actual wardrobe on, on stage, then it has to be durable, it has to be sustainable because we're moving, we're doing upwards of 360 shows a year, uh, 10 shows a week sometimes. You have to make sure that it's working. For example, the uh, Double Dutch team that was out here today, that's neoprene. And it's also uh, the same kind of texture that you would find in a diving suit, a wetsuit. Wow. So, and also, they can only be worn on one artist. What a lot of people don't realize is once we create these shows and we cast these artists, to replace one artist is thousands of dollars of investment. Once we find this young artist in Peru, for example, we go through immigrations, we go through medical, then we go through trainings, and then we go through the costuming of that one artist. So by the time they get to us eight weeks later on tour, there's been a huge investment 
once they put on that garment. I would like to see you guys going through the TSA pre-line and uh, <laughs> <laughs> what happens there. There must be some fun you guys have in airports. Um, but also the dry cleaning bill for that must be terrible. <laughs> Huge. <laughs> if yeah. you can even find someone to. But like these are the things you have to think about, you know. So not only do they have to be sustainable, but you have to have sort of enough inventory you can rotate through them. And yeah, and some of the costumes also have to be designed so that they are integrated to the performance, so they become also a performance component. Let's mm. see if you have to wear something on your head, and if it's too heavy, then it will influence the mechanic of the movement, okay? Or if you need some protective areas, then that has to be developed. Costume's the probably costume. the wrong word, really. Yeah, I don't yeah. know what the right yeah, word yeah. is, but it's, it's integral to Absolutely, yeah. and, and also there's another layer to it is that we have inventors right here on site with us. For example, on our team, we have a wardrobe, our head of wardrobe, Karen, who is absolutely amazing. We're also dealing in real time when something, a, a piece of wardrobe malfunctions or right. they're having to be innovators and recreate. This past week we had a great um, reality where we re had to restructure a piece of the wardrobe that the conceptor conceived. So there's a lot of checks and balances, but she was smart enough and fast enough with her team to redesign this element, also come up with a prop that everyone goes, we should sell that in the merch, uh, merch <laughs> resident. <laughs> Bonus. <laughs> Um, do you guys have, I talked about the airport thing, it made me think, like, are there any rituals that you guys have? Do you travel as a crew, like all, did you, how many did you say, 300 some people in, the, in a production like this? Do you hang out before and after, or do you sort of meet on stage and disperse? What's the behind the scenes culture of Cirque like? It truly is a family. I mean, it's a circus culture, and it, the tradition is real. Uh, we are a family. We start typical days for most of us are at noon. Uh, our technical team will arrive on site at That's 9 That's just like us. Uh, right, exactly. <laughs> uh, you spend your whole day together. We eat together. Uh, literally, we have three chefs that travel with us. We have a full That's kitchen. just like us. We're, we're the same. That's why we're working together. Yeah. Um, and and you're, yeah, you're together. All the, the artists train every single day. We're evolving the show, and we typically end our days around 11 o'clock, and uh, we travel together, most of us. Um, so yeah, it's quite intense. There are no secrets, and if there are, good luck. <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's the model of, of, of touring as you have now with the Big Cup, but also there's the arena. Uh, you know, shows that are even faster in terms of, of their uh, change of, of different, different cities. And then we've got also the model of uh, Vegas, who is, you know, which is right. uh, you know, a resident show. Right. And then people come in and out and they go to their, their house after that, which is also a different model. How many Cirque shows are in production at any given instant? Uh, uh, this year in operation, we have more than 20 shows in operation. Wow. Uh, and then for 2019, we will have uh, nine premieres uh, uh, that we will be spreading throughout the year, which is uh, the biggest number that we have ever done so <laughs> far. So we're all nervous about it. Uh, we've, we will be delivering a, a show in April and then a new show also in China and then one in Germany and so on and so on. Incredible. Yeah. That's really prolific. I mean, it's enough to put on one show like Volta, but to do synchronously as many shows you, you are doing, it's really stunning, the scale at which you uh, the, 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 the Also, the thing that you have to look at is it's when you have the, the, you know, the cast that is currently uh, doing the show, then you've got to look at how you will establish a system that will uh, allow you know, the, the turnover, the yeah. replacement. And currently, it's about 14% you know, a year that I have to, to replace over 1,300 artists that is currently in performance on our stage. So You guys yeah. really are Google. You're dealing with attrition. You're dealing with hiring, yeah. finding suitable talent, yeah. you know, the best of the best. It's a lot, lot we have in common here. Um, so tell me about. Uh, Cirque's role in the performing arts altogether. You really did come out of a circus tradition, but you really created something that is unlike anything else, even to this day. Uh, but have you moved the industry? Are there, um, is there evidence that you've sort of changed both uh, everything from theater to circuses to other aspects of the mm -hmm. performing arts? What is the sort of greater historical context of Cirque? You know, what I would say is the influence that it's had in the world of artistry. I mean, you can't go to a concert nowadays without some influence of Cirque. Mm -hmm. uh, when I do a halftime show, 
I'm enrolling that aerial acrobatic level. I mean, when you see the opening ceremonies of the Olympics, Cirque is there, you know right. what I mean? It's, it's really set the, the foundation of how far you can go in the, in the entertainment industry. Yeah. Even in theater, you know, the Broadway model has changed, which is very exciting. So we've made our mark, which is very exciting. Uh, you know, and I think the goal always is to stay relevant mm. uh, and to stay current and really keep telling great stories that move people. And I think that uh, as a result of that, everyone sort of jumps on board, you know. Mm. And we've influenced a lot also the, 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 you know, what I would say the physical practice. So there is now a big wave of innovation, the young people that are basically being influenced by us and developing new acts or new ways to actually present their craft and ability. That's quite, a, quite interesting, and this is very also interesting from my group in casting and looking at these new disciplines or this, these new performances that are emerging. One thing that's hard, given the ridiculously high bar you've set for yourself, where do you go next? I mean, obviously there's more, and you sort of have you know, covered the world in terms of uh, number of performing shows and in residence in Vegas, and, um, and then they're sort of moving the... Um, the quality and, and nature of the performance. Mm -hmm. um, are there other things you're thinking, like new modalities? Like, is VR a possibility? Like, can I sit on my couch and experience Cirque? Like, what are, what, where do you go from here? Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question. It's a big, big challenge. It's how do we, we reinvent ourselves or what kind of other avenues that we could, we could look at. Um, in, in fact, we're developing new product, like Creative is, is an example that's been done in a Club Med, and it's basically in participation in nature. But using technology, the VR also, we, we've used that and we've created uh, uh, possibilities, let's, let's see, for uh, people in, in Vegas in some of these uh, permanent show to experience uh, the show from the inside using VR as, as an example. And then we're venturing and exploring all sorts of these, uh, these possibilities. But broader than that also, the company, uh, even though it keeps its core uh, product, which is um, human base, uh, circus base, as an example, uh, then we're broadening. We've, uh, as you know, I mean, the company is, has been, uh, you know, bought, and then we've also acquired a new uh, group of, that are also doing performances. Uh, the works, as an example, there is more in the magic world, so then we're looking at these, uh, these areas as well. Mm -hmm. Anything to add, Brian? Yeah, you know, what I, I would say is that just, uh, I would say that the company is always looking for the new innovation and, and innovators. And I think for me today, on, uh, when I came here uh, on campus for the first time, I had the same excitement that I have when I go to our headquarters in Montreal. You're just watching and seeing these things that are happening that you, happening, that you recognize that people are changing the way we do things right here. Mm. And I think Cirque is the same way. When I walk into the wardrobe department and I see the wardrobe with the technical department and they have this beautiful dress that they're creating that will bloom in front of an artist, mm -hmm. the audience's eyes, that's very exciting. I think it's just about forward innovation and not trying to outdo ourselves, but keep pushing the envelope. You know? So for each of you, and if, if you don't have an answer, that's okay, but is there something you've been itching to do, like some element you want to introduce or some direction you want to take, take Cirque that you're willing to share with us now? And if you'd rather surprise us next year, we'll wait and see, but is there something uh, that's personal for you that you want to sort of see happen? Uh, from from uh, a, a human performance perspective, which is, you know, my core responsibility, um, there, is, there is a part of that integration of all of the illusion world, you know, and the technological world and the human performance that actually we're pushing to another level, and especially with the show that is coming up in, uh, you know, in, in Orlando, uh, Soon with uh, Walt Disney, I think we will we will have something that will be surprising. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> you're all invited to to go there. Uh, I think we've 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 pushed the, the the frontier of of some of the performances. Exciting. Yeah. You know, for me, as a very personal, it, I I feel like uh, we've gotten so far in innovation, which is very exciting. All of us, and we we're led by our smartphones and all of those things. And when I go to a concert or I go to an experience, I recognize that we're really quick to pick up our phones and capture the moment. Uh, for me, as a baby of the theater, I love when people put them down 
and they're impacted by what we do. Mm. So on a personal level, I want to help keep creating theater, a circus that is pulling people in and away from their technology while experiencing technology right in front of them and art come together. So that's sort of my own personal sort of ambition. Yeah, I think, as I understand it, that's one of the themes of Volta is a little bit how technology can become a barrier towards human connection. It's something we think about a lot here in terms of digital health. We both create the phones, but we also want to create the tools that let people use them responsibly and interact at a, at a very human level. So we very much resonate with that mission and uh, we're appreciative of the, of the work that you're doing. Um, we're going to turn it over to some questions from the audience. And you know how we do it here. There's mics in both aisles. And in order to be uh, efficient, it would be helpful if you guys could line up, start thinking about what questions you might want to ask. Um, and as we do that, we will invite some of the performers back up on stage uh, to do that in just a minute. But before we do that, is there anything else that, that you guys would want us to know about your process, about CERC, about um, anything we've talked about here that we didn't touch on? Um, from my perspective, I think, you know, I have to commend the, the, the work that is done with the artistic director and the whole cast when they are actually on the road because that first step that we do in creating the show, which is, you know, contained in, in terms of time and, 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 and money, then is being after that supported uh, let's see, for 10 years as an example. And then you have this, this surrounding system that is supporting the individual and in creating the best possible environment, either from a training perspective, from a performance medicine perspective, from a, a performance safety, uh, and then from an artistic eye. Uh, I think that's, that's one of the things that it's important to understand all of this effort that is being done in order to allow these performers to be at their best every day, considering there is a lot of variability and the show is never the same. Yeah. I really, uh, again, draw parallels to Google. We work really hard to make an experience which is effortless and seamless and instant and magical for you. Behind the scenes, there's so much work that goes into creating something so delightful and simple. Um, so we definitely appreciate all that you do and all that the performers do to make that possible. Ron, anything you want to add? Yeah, you know, and thank you, Bernard. I, th I think, um, you know, when you see these amazing artists, uh, what their level of commitment is unbelievable. I mean, they, they're world class. And when we find them and they come into this culture, we really try to create this family, this level of support. If you were ever to come backstage at one of our shows, I'm always amazed that after a show or maybe two shows, it will be 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, and these artists are still training. Mm. It's unbelievable. They will walk right off stage with our coaching team and in real time, on the playback, watch their performance and self-evaluate. That level of commitment and dedication, mm -hmm. week after week, I think that so often we get caught up in the performance of the show, and we walk away from it, and we got wild by it. But there's a real stamina and a real dedication that I think uh, we sometimes forget because we might make it look too easy. Is that sort of a practice you do, a post-mortem to sort of review the show, see what worked, what didn't, and... and Absolutely, yeah. but you know, it's driven by the artists, believe yeah. it or not. Yeah. Our job is to manage and maintain show quality, but their commitment is, un they actually push us. Wow. You know, their expectation and what they need to deliver, and they are frustrated. You know, if we, for example, we were in San Francisco a couple months ago and we had high winds. Mm. And to the point that we have safety protocol in the big top that when those gale force winds, if they get up to 60 miles an hour, we have to decide, are we gonna cut? The artists wanna keep going. They have that show must go on reality. And our job is to help support while at the same time That's protect. It. Yeah. Okay. So it's a fascinating di dichotomy that we're yeah. working Yeah, wow. In. Let's invite the artists back up. Yeah. <laughs> Martha, why don't you introduce everybody? You want to introduce them? Okay. Yeah. Hello, guys. Nice to meet you. We are skippers from Volta. How was the, our act? You guys enjoyed? <laughs> Thank sure. you very much. We are from Japan. Someone from Japan? Anyone? From, well, they're watching oh. on uh, oh. video. <laughs> 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 
So that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, great. Do you have names you want to share or not? <laughs> yeah. my, my name is Masa and Yabi, Tomoko, Jun, Ryota. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. OK, let's get to have some questions. Green mic first. One topic of conversation always at Google is trust. Trust with our users, trust with our peers, trust with our executive. Um, unless I miss my guess, trust is sort of fundamental to the circus world. Are there things that you do uh, within the family to help you build trust, either at the head office or on the road, things like that? Like, are there, you know, are there tricks that you use or things that you do? Um, maybe I can talk, you know, with that process that we use when uh, when we're developing a, developing an act. I, I'll take it as an example. You know, the teeter board. You know, where the people are bouncing, uh, you know, from, from both sides. Um, in Montreal. I am in charge of what we call the training before they actually go on, on, on the show. So we are inviting people coming from the trampoline world, and we could have uh, maybe pe people coming from France, from the US, from, uh, you know, from Russia, and et cetera. And they will meet together right there, OK? And then they, will, they have to work together. And Tito Board is a very dangerous uh, act. Um, so what we do in order to make sure that actually we, we create that trust is we, we go step by step in terms of processes, okay? Having them, okay, to go through all of the basics, uh, all of the language. Uh, we also provide, um, I may have two or three uh, translator there to provide the appropriate communication between all of them I will have an artistic coach, an acrobatic coach at the same time surrounding the entire environment to make sure that they develop their own dialogue and communication and they understand each other in terms of who should do what and when and what kind of reaction they should have. And they will go through weeks of training okay, in developing that and then step by step Okay, then the coach will step back, step back, and then transfer that responsibility of the group to manage the performance, to dialogue between themselves, to brief and debrief. And that's, that's what Ron was uh, you know, saying, is we develop also that debriefing culture as part of the process. So then when the performance is done, then they will revisit, look at the video and the replay, and then talk about it and you know, self-evaluate. Trust is number one. I mean, it's unbelievable how critical these checks and balances are, and we take them daily. For example, when we have to put a new artist into the show, they, do, they will never walk, um, come to us and go right on stage. We have to do a full show validation in the reality that they're going to be performing in. Just the change of the lights can change their world, and if they don't understand that and they haven't had a chance, a chance to prepare, it can become a challenge for them. So absolutely, and that's how we build that into our systems and balance, yeah. Merci, Anka. Yeah. This is a slightly different question, but these artists who are at the top of their game and, and you know, rock stars in their respective disciplines, sometimes rock stars can develop rock star attitudes and be a little bit diva-like or prima donna. Um, <laughs> uh, have you ever, like, do you have to work on that too? Like, is, is, um, have you asked people to leave that can't get with the family? You know, we all have strange uncles, but um, is, is, is that part of this, sort of making sure that people um, really do have the right attitude as well as the right talent? That is a, a key part of the job as well, is, is really maintaining the family environment that there is no, if you think about Cirque du Soleil, there is no name other than Guy, you know what I mean? You don't hear of the artist it, it performing in. Cirque is the star, Cirque is the brand. We want the artist to understand that we all bring a contribution to it, and there are times that some artists can't fit inside of this bubble, uh, and we respect that because we always encourage people to find where your light is going to shine the brightest. Mm. That's the most important thing. If it doesn't feel like it's bright here, we will support you in finding that place that's right for you. That is a great way to give feedback. Thank you for <laughs> I'm going to use that. It's a very interesting question because if and I look at the casting at large, okay, we've got circus professionals, we've got people coming from the arts, you know, singing, dancers and musicians and so on, but we also have more than 30% coming from sport. And from sport, 
Okay, you're, you want to be the best, you want to be on the podium. Mm. So when you leave that culture and you, you, you come to our environment, okay, then you're becoming part of that family. So you, mm. you're, you're, you're uh, engaged to develop that ability to actually uh, sort of personally disappear and be a contributor mm. to the show. And, and uh, we ensure that this process is also part of what we do in Montreal to make sure that these people that were coming with, let's see, gold medal at the you know, Worlds or Olympics, okay, they will put that mm -hmm. here, okay, and now they will adopt the culture of, of Cirque du Soleil. Amazing. Okay, yellow mic. Uh, hi, thank you for coming uh, and talking to us. Um, I was wondering how much time does it take from the time you conceptualize a show to the time it opens? And within that time period, how much time is spent in choreography and training and, and things like okay. that? Okay. Um, it, it could take from, you know, from the initial let's see, team and then the selection of the uh, stage director and, and a couple of other cre uh, creators, the director of creation and so on, from two to three years. Uh, now, then that is basically developing the, from the idea, the whole concept, and through that journey is also identifying, okay, the, the different profiles of artists that will be needed, and then so that we can proceed through the casting, because casting takes a long time, and sometimes also it's also being uh, influenced by immigration and, and all sorts of, of obstacles. And then after that, we have the training period. The training period, let's see, as an example, the, the, the big top that we will be producing in April, then we started the training per period uh, last September, last year in 2018, and then from uh, fall to December, then we only did the training, and at the same time, then the costume were designed, developed, and so on, and all sorts of other technical aspects were developed, and equipment, and so on. And then January, then you start the rehearsal, and the rehearsal continues to uh, up to the moment that we transfer in April, in March, uh, under the big top. And that whole rehearsal is being done in Montreal in a big, big studio. That's what we could do that inside because it's cold in Montreal. <laughs> and, and then after that, we transfer in April, and then we will be opening, uh, let's see, this new show, Alegria, by uh, mid-April. I mean, now. Mm. Great question. Yes, green mic. And I watched the show last Saturday. It was amazing. So I have a question. So I remember in the show, there's an artist. I think her name is Danila Kem. She was dancing along on the stand, stage with her hair uh, tied and the hand on top. That part was very different from the rest of the show. So from the perspective of storytelling, could you help me understand how this part fits the rest of the story? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I got the question. <laughs> from the perspective of so storytelling, how does that element fit in with the rest of the show? Because she found it to be ah. very different. I love that you asked that question. Yes. The idea, the, the conceptor is always thinking, for us as individuals, we put on mask or we put on our, our armor every day when we walk out of the door. And the goal is take off the armor, take off your mask, and then fly higher. So when we get to the part of the show with the hair suspension, it's all about fly as high as you can and let it be sort of feel like you're in outer space with, where there is no gravity. You know, that's the idea of hair suspension. Thank you. Did that help? Yes. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I can imagine with the degree that safety is important and the degree that er all of this is transpiring in front of us live, that it can be very difficult to make the go or no-go call, and that's something that the general stage manager, the performer, is that ever a difficult thing with this feeling of uh, the show must go on to be able to negotiate what is possible and what's impossible as, as things go, as people miss tricks, as people say, I can do it the next time? Great question, 100%. Uh, there is that moment where we all have to make a collective decision, and I always say, um, uh, more heads together are better because when we get to those moments where it can be we've pushed too hard, fatigue could be setting in, or the environment that we're in just, just not sustainable, we do have to make that decision. The show does not go on. It's something that we don't like to do because we respect that our audiences come from all over uh, to see a Cirque du Soleil show. Mm -hmm. We respect that many times when someone comes to a show, it's for a a uh, 50-year wedding anniversary, a birthday celebration. They're very special moments, what, what gets people under the big top. So we want to deliver 
But at the end of the day, safety, safety, mm -hmm. safety. And we take that into consideration every day. Yeah, in the phase of creation, it's interesting also of the safety management, you know, especially when we create an act. We will develop the equipment, the equipment will be uh, tested, engineered, and then we'll also develop the act by selecting, okay, what is sub-maximal. We're not in a competition, so we're not trying to do, you know, let's see, the one best one time. Okay, we're making sure that the, 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 the content is being selected so that it's within the resource of that individual. And then we will also test these over time to ensure that when it's integrated in the act, okay, then it will be, it will be uh, sustained. Uh, so in, in fact, I mean, your question is very, very interesting and it's, it's a, a preoccupation of mine right from the onset of creation. How far should we push? Okay, obviously we're doing circus, so there is, there is, uh, there is a risk there. Uh, and then we're creating uh, every processes that is possible to ensure that not only we select people that are really good from the onset, but also we make all the, the, pos the, the progression and the steps to verify and validate these performances under various circumstances up to the show condition with lighting and music and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, green mic. Thanks so much for coming out. Uh, my question is, um, when there's a creative difference or disagreement, uh, how do you resolve it? First of all, you have to look at the, the globality. So we are inviting these creators to come at Cirque du Soleil, but we're also assigning what we call a, a director of creation. This person is to manage the environment and manage that dialogue and sometimes this tension. It's not, you know, it's not, nice every day, it's, there's sometimes all of these tensions. And eventually, okay, uh, this group will have to come up to an agreement to take an option. Obviously, the stage director has a lot of power because he wants to protect the basic or the intent. Uh, on my side, I have an equipment designer and a performance designer. And as soon as it steps into the exposure of risk, which could be life-threatening, then that's where the buck stops. You know, it's, so then it will be a no-no. Uh, everything else after that is open for discussion, open for dialogue, open for conversation. Um, and obviously, as you go up to the premiere, there will be time by which then you realize that this is not possible, or this could be dangerous, or this will not render what you're looking at in terms of uh, the expectation of performance. Just in terms of decision-making process, do you have a traditional hierarchy or do you have a holacracy? Is there someone whose job it is to make a call about what's in, what's out? Like that's well-defined and established? Uh, somewhat, although it has a little bit of a holistic uh, approach. When it was Guy La Liberté as the sole owner, I would have to say to be, you know, being present, um, that he would uh, say, okay, I will give you another three weeks, mm -hmm. and if you don't convince me, then that's, that's the, the end of it. Um, now that has changed a little bit, okay, Guy is not there anymore, so the director of creation is, is exercising that responsibility, uh, and then eventually the, the, the uh, executive producer may at some point also exercise that. Got it. Okay, um, we have time maybe for one or two more questions. I wanted to prioritize if anyone has any questions for the performers. We didn't just bring you up here to look at you, although <laughs> we do enjoy looking at you as well. But if there's a question for the performer, could you come forward? Yes, please. Hello, thank you for coming out here today. Um, I'm very curious, kind of in the process of developing your act or in training this act, was there a particular difficulty or like a story that you would like to share about kind of where you ran into kind of a crossroads and you had to make a decision how you overcame that to create the wonderful performance you had today? Uh, we are kind of like new skipping team. We have been together for two years. Then we have like specific like trick each other. Then we like, create the act, what you can do, what you want to do in our act. Then we talk each other, then we, that's the important is how we connect each other. Like we use the ropes, then how we, how you turn in. That's a very important. If someone is like slowly and faster, that's the, we're gonna like, we cannot jump in the ropes. That's a very, how this point, yeah. So the main problem is the damn rope. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, I think we have time for one more. Yes, please. Hi, this is, um, thank you very much for visiting. Uh, I have a casting question that's mainly for Bernard. Um, I'm wondering when you see a performance, whether it's on YouTube or in person or, or whatever other venue, um, what makes you think that you know, maybe that person would make a good Cirque du Soleil performer? And at that point, like, do you have a job interview or what happens, like how does that happen? That's, a, that's interesting. It's a really good question. Uh, basically, okay, the way I will answer is uh, within my casting team, I've got um, a scouts that are specialized in various areas, either be in dance or uh, in musicians or singers and so on. If they see something on YouTube, then, then two things will come to their head. One is, would I select that person because of what is being done reaches that level that I'm looking for? Uh, then it's, they're more in a selection mode based on their specialty. So I've got people specialized in trampoline, in, in tumbling, in acro, and etc. So they'll take that decision. Or they will look at that and they will say, they will basically because of their education and their background, they'll say there is an indication here that there is a potential that if we were to tap into what I see, that we could eventually push it further. Okay, so they will, they're, they're gonna be more on a detection mode. And then when they are in the detect, detection mode, they will present that to the new creative group or then we will venture on our own decision to meet these people, to spend time with them, to get to know them better and to look at any opportunity to venture or collaborate together so that because of the indication of the potential or the detection of that possibility that we can uh, eventually venture and develop something with them. I would just add one last thing because this happened in real time and I love that how our worlds are colliding today. So uh, then Bernard's team will then send me uh, a perfect, uh, uh, a particular profile. Uh, so I'm looking to replace an artist right now. So I get them, they're, uh, they're uploaded onto a platform, uh, sometimes YouTube. But yesterday, in real time, I talked to three different artists, one in Tel Aviv, one in London, and one in New York, all on Google Chat, because wow. all I got to see was their performance. So we asked them, can you jump on? In 30 minutes, I was able to identify who my next candidate would be. Amazing. So that's how we're working together, which I love it. I didn't even think about that <laughs> till now. Awesome. So. <laughs> on that note, um, there's sort of uh, one group of people I'd like to thank before we thank Cirque, which is our own behind the scenes staff. These, this magic of scheduling this event and lighting this event and producing this event doesn't happen by accident. So let's take a moment to thank the people behind the scenes at Talks at Google. And most of all, let's thank the amazing performers and production team and executives of Cirque du Soleil for doing what you do, not only for coming here, but for doing what you do in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.